Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Yukimi Kunata. I am the first. I am a first secretary of the Embassy of Japan and uh, deputy director of the JICC. Uh, welcome to uh, today's talk given by Mr. Eric Sol, who is historian and collector of the photos of the current exhibit uh, titled "Go for Broke: Japanese American Soldiers Fighting on Two Fronts." First, I would like to introduce Mr. Gerald Yamada, President of the Japanese American Veterans Association. Gerald, please. Good afternoon. First, I want to start by thanking Eric Saul uh, for sharing his fabulous collection of photographs with us. I also want to thank the Japan Information and Cultural Center uh, and the Embassy of Japan for making this facility available for the exhibit and for this program. This is the second exhibit that the Japanese American Veterans Association as co-sponsored with the JICC and the Embassy of Japan. We have developed a very good cooperative working relationship with the JIC and the Embassy that allows us to co-sponsor many photo exhibits such as the one we have here today. The Go For Broke exhibit is a collection of photos of young Japanese American men and women taken during World War II. Because the nation distrusted them based solely on their ethnicity, they were motivated to prove their loyalty to America. They chose to serve in the face of overt prejudice. They substantially helped to win the war in Europe and the Pacific their service is an American story, and they forged a legacy for all Americans. Their legacy shows the importance of patriotism. Public opinion polls today show that Americans don't value patriotism as an important value. Their service teaches us that embracing patriotism is a meaningful and effective way to fight prejudice. As President Truman stated on July 15, 1946, when he reviewed the returning 442nd Regimental Combat Team at the White House, he said, quote, you fought, not, you fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you won, close quote. Their legacy also reminds us of the importance of keeping our faith in American values. America made a mistake in incarcerating 120 innocent Japanese Americans. In recognition of their service, America apologized, made amends, and affirmed its commitment to equal justice for all. Their le legacy enriches the importance of American values. We must all embrace the Go for Growth legacy and continue to carry it forward. I hope you enjoy our program and our exhibit. It is my uh, honor and pr privilege to introduce uh, our speaker, Eric Saul. Eric served as curator, as the founding curator of the Military Museum at the Presidio in San Francisco from 1973 to 1986. As director of the Presidio Army Museum, he curated, designed, and installed a number of exhibits on the contributions of minorities to the U.S. military. In 1980, Eric co-founded the Gopher Rope 100 442nd MIS Foundation 
later called the National Japanese American Historical Society, which is located in San Francisco. He was curator uh, from 1981 to 1987. Eric is presently work, writing a major new book on diplomatic rescue in World War II. May I welcome Eric Saul. Diplomatic Rescue, or the Japanese American book. I'm working on actually two Japanese American books. So we're actually in the process of publishing a book called Katong. <laughs> Everybody know what Katong is? Raise your hand if you don't know what Katong is. <laughs> when Japanese Americans fought in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, they fought from Hawaii, from the West Coast, the Midwest, and New York. Most of them came either from Hawaii or the West Coast. So they were kind of culturally different from each other. Even though they were Japanese Americans, they were raised in a different cultural milieu. If you were a Japanese American from Hawaii, one third of the population of Hawaii, <coughs> you were not uh, a really tiny minority, but part of the, the overall population of Hawaii. And if you were from California or the West Coast, there were only about 150,000 people from the West Coast and the Midwest. And they were raised in small communities where they were the tiny minority. And in fact, Japanese Americans in California, Hawaii, I mean, California and the West Coast were less than two-tenths of one percent of the population of the West Coast. And so when they fought together, they had two separate sets of identities. The Hawaii's, the Hawaiian's Nisei Sobas had a lot more confidence, part of a dominant culture, a culture of growing up in Hawaii where it was sort of an aloha uh, brotherhood. So there was Chinese and Filipinos and Portuguese, but it was this confidence that they had. The Niseis who served from the West Coast mostly had volunteered from relocation camps, as you know, that they'd been interned during the war. So when they got together to train in Camp Shelby, there was two sets of sensibilities. You had the confident Hawaiians training, and who had a sort of a go for broke, happy-go-lucky. Niseis from the West Coast, coming from the camps, uh, were much more, how would you say, uh, introspective and quiet and, and hurt. And the two groups necessarily didn't understand where each was coming from. So if you were from Hawaii, the sobriquet that they used was butahe, B-U-T-A, which is sort of like pig head. So you were a or pineapple boy or pineapple. And if you were from the West Coast, you were known as a katonk. And a katonk was the sound of a, co a coconut hitting an empty floor. Or if and the Nisei soldiers who were fighting with each other from Hawaii, they literally were fighting, and they were beating each other up. And they, they beat up a mainlander. Um, his head hitting the floor was called katonk, katonk, katonk. So it's, inter it's an interesting, so the katonk is a, is a is a term for mainland Nisis. And so the book that we're publishing uh, is an oral history of uh, Mr. Chester Tanaka. Chester Tanaka was a Katonk, from, not even from the West Coast, he was from um, St. Louis. But I'll, I'll come back to that story in a few minutes, the story that we're doing this morning. So the first question that people ask me is, well, how did somebody like myself wind up doing the Japanese American exhibit? How did you get interested in how did you develop it? How, is, how did it come about? 
I, I, I'm from uh, Los Angeles. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, raised in Los Angeles, moved to San Francisco in my 20s to become a director of, of a new military history museum in San Francisco called the Presidio Army Museum. The Presidio is on the northern tip of the peninsula of San Francisco. It's what the Jason to the Golden Gate Bridge. And it was an army base that was established in 1775, and it was the second oldest army base continuously active in the United States. So the army decided to build a museum there in 1973, a commemorative museum, and I was hired as the first curator. So I started reading the history of the Presidio, and it was very interesting. And one of the things that struck me was the decision to intern Japanese Americans during World War II was made by the two commanding officers, two senior officers at the Presidio of San Francisco. And I had just barely heard about it growing up in California, but I didn't know anything to the extent of the decision-making process, the politics behind it, how it happened. So I read the history of the Presidio and got sort of interested and did a little mini exhibit on the decision by the United States government to basically in turn one of its minorities during World War II, 120,000 people. In the process, um, in 1977, um, I decided to do an exhibit on Japanese American soldiers in World War II. And I had raised money, by 1980, I had raised $15,000 from my board of directors was called the Fort Point and Army Museum Association. I had done a, an exhibit on the history of black soldiers in the Army, which was very, very popular, based on a large collection of photographs by a friend of mine who had collected them in the 1960s and 70s. Very popular. The exhibit is still traveling, and it was called Ready and Forward. And I said, well, how about doing an exhibit on a story that's, that's more um, local to San Francisco? That was the story of Japanese Americans in World War II. What did I know? I only knew that I had seen the movie Go For Broke. How many people have seen the, the 1954 movie Go For Broke? Raise your hand. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you can get it on Netflix, you can get it online. It's called Go For Broke, 1954, stars Van Johnson. It's quite a good movie. When it was made by MGM, it was their third or fourth highest grossing film in the year and a big success. And I remember seeing it as a kid, and the theme of the movie was that Japanese Americans volunteered from camps and ironically became the most decorated unit in the history of the United States Army. And that fascinated me. So in 1980, I wrote a proposal and said, we're going to actually create the exhibit. So I did not know a Japanese American soldier. I never met them. In fact, I don't think I'd ever met a Japanese American period. So I was sort of in a bind. I had $15,000 to create an exhibit. There was only one book on the topic, which I had read, which didn't give me a lot of information. So I said, I better get in touch and see if there's any veterans living in, in and around San Francisco who can help me be advisors and put this exhibit together. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How many people believe in fate curing, or destiny, or things were meant to be? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. So the Japanese word for destiny is ume. I didn't know that word at the time. So how does ume play a part in my doing this exhibit and how this all came about? Literally three days after the board, my board of directors gave me the authorization to do this exhibit. And I'll tell you why in a minute why they authorized me to do the exhibit. I, I sitting in my office, and a man, an oriental man, came into my office, a full colonel's uniform, and he had a little name tag. And the name said Oyasato. I said, I wonder if that's a Japanese name. And if it is, I wonder if this person can help me connect with the Japanese American community. And he introduced himself. He says, my name is Henry Oyasato. I'm a retiring colonel here at Sixth Army at the Presidio, and I saw your black soldiers exhibit. He said, I was really impressed with it. I think you ought to do an exhibit 
and Japanese Americans. And he said, I happen to be one of the officers I commanded that company during World War II. Wow. And I said, oh my God, God bless you. And I gave him a big hug and I said, you saved my life. And he said, I'll put you in touch. I'll help you any way you want. I'll put you in touch with all the boys that live in San Francisco. And he asked me, um, I told him, how did you know I was doing the exhibit? He says, I didn't know. I just, I just was inspired to come into your room. It's completely, completely, okay. it's completely by chance. Now, how many people are more spiritual than that story? And I've got a lot of these stories that go along with it. So he put me in touch with a, a whole group of veterans living in the Bay Area, dozens. And they brought me photographs and uniforms and papers and albums and stories and diaries. And I just was overwhelmed. And they were so proud to say, yes, we'd love to help you tell this story. And they asked me, why do you, why do you want to tell the story? So I told this Colonel Oyasato, he said, I had seen um, the movie Go For Broke. It was made by MGM. And that was sort of my inspiration. And he said, oh, by the way, I was an actor in that movie. I was the star of the Gopher Broke movie. And he gave me an actual script that was given to him by the studio. So he played the, the role of Sergeant O'Hara in the movie. So talk about fate. You know, and I got chills. I'm getting, anybody getting chills now? <laughs> this is all, all true stories, absolutely true. So I was flooded with love and attention by these Nisei men who at the time, so this is 1980-81, and this is basically 40 years after the war. So they're all in their late 50s and early 60s. And they, are, they said, Eric, we'll help you in any way possible. I said, what you can do is tell me why the heck you would join the army from an internment camp. Why would you join the army from a prison camp? Why would you join the army when your, your parents couldn't become citizens? Why would you join the army when you were discriminated against at almost every level in American society? Why would you join the army and how was it in God's green earth that you could have rose to the occasion being the most decorated military unit in the 200, at that time, the 200 year history of the United States Army. And they said, um, my parents depended on us to prove something, to prove our loyalty as Americans. And we wanted to prove that the decision by the federal government and by the Army that it had made a wrong decision, that we were not disloyal, we were not questionable citizens. Because of our Japanese ancestry, we were not in any way a threat to the United States. And we knew if we did a good job, if we fought well, if we did a good job, that, that our parents would get out of those camps. And if we ever had children someday, or wanted to have a better life, we were patriotic soldiers. We could change the way America saw us. So their regimental motto was go for broke, which is something they determined their motto would be. And that's a Hawaiian gambling term, which means give your all. When the Army created the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, they originally created it on February 1st, 1943. And there was a lot of ambivalence by the United States Army to create an all Japanese American unit. So there was a prescient young man who was president of JACL at the time, named Mike Masaoka, who was friends, became a good friend of mine. He said, if you're going to put us in these camps and put us in this position, going to have to give us a chance to prove ourselves. So he made friends with John J. McCloy. And John J. McCloy was a special assistant to the General Marshall, the Secretary of the Army. And he said, you put us in camps and we cooperated with you. We, we 
went along with that, even though we disagreed with the policy. Now you have to do something for us. You have to let us serve in the army. And McCloy actually said to him, we'll, we'll put you in segregated units. We'll segregate you throughout the army. We will do that. He said, no, you have to let us fight as a segregated unit. So if we do have a good battle record, we can prove something. So it went up the chain of command, and I have a long oral history with, with Mike Masabuka about his advocacy going to uh, the, the senior generals of the army and the undersecretary, and there was a big decision paper written, signed by Marshall and by a number of senior commanders for and against the creation of a Japanese American unit. At the time, um, the U.S. Army was a segregated army. Women were segregated, African Americans were segregated. If you were a Mexican American, you were in segregated companies. If you were Filipino, you were also served in a segregated unit. So McCloy said, you know what, Mike? I owe you, there was no resistance by the Japanese American community to the executive order signed in 1942 to intern Japanese Americans. No resistance whatsoever. So McCloy said, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna advocate creation of the unit, and he actually did. So on February 1st, 1943, the United States Army authorized the creation of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. A year before that, Japanese Americans had volunteered for service from Hawaii in another unit called the 100th Infantry Battalion. It was an experimental unit. And I had interviewed senior officers in, in the 442nd. One of them was Colonel Hanley. Colonel Hanley was commander of the 2nd Battalion, and a, the executive officer was Harold Rebusel, Major Rebusel. And <clears throat> They were tasked by the Army to write reports to be sent to General Marshall and to McCloy to say, as the Japanese Americans were training, as they were training and creating a, a record, how well were they doing? And was there any evidence of disloyalty or, or anything, anything? So uh, Colonel Hanley and Colonel Rebusel wrote these glowing reports saying these Japanese American men are patriotic and they train well, they're, <clears throat> they're loyal, they're honest, I haven't had better troops under my command at any time. So the white officers <clears throat> that commanded the companies, the battalions, and the unit, fortunately, 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 were sympathetic to, to the plight of the Nisans. They knew that they had volunteered from camps <clears throat> and had come from Hawaii as, 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 a, as a minority. They were very sympathetic to their, to their needs. So they said um, to a large, you know, I, and I have to say a funny story. I asked Colonel Hanley, <clears throat> were, were there any disciplinary problems among Japanese Americans? He said, not at all. He said, you know how I, I threatened them? I, went through, I said, if you misbehave, I'll write a letter to your mother. And that was strong enough to make everybody behave themselves. So they trained, they have the best training, they have the best field record. So finally, after training for more than a year, they were offered to all the major commands in Europe. But the one commander who wanted them was Mark Clark. So Mark Clark, <clears throat> by the way, I got to know Mark Clark, believe it or not. He was a three-star, later four-star general, commanding the Mediterranean Theater, so the Italian theater. And Mark Clark had grown up in California, and he knew Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, and Filipinos. So in fighting the Italian campaign, he basically said, if you have Japanese Americans, send me all you got. So he was their commanding officer and very, very, very sympathetic. And uh, Mark Clark had said they were among the best troops he had ever served with. We did a documentary where we interviewed him. He said, I was so proud. He commanded a million men in the Mediterranean theater. He says, among the best soldiers I had. 
was the 3,000 uh, or the 4,500 soldiers that fought in the 442nd. So ultimately, 33,000 Japanese Americans fought in World War II in an army of 16 million people. So the United States Army, Marines, and Navy was 16 million people. And that doesn't even include war workers. So if you say 33,000 Japanese Americans, you're talking about a fraction of 1% of the soldiers. So how was it that they went from being a mistrusted minority to the most decorated unit in the history of the United States Army? I want to backtrack this for a second. Something just came to my mind. How was it that the United States violated its own principles in 1942 and signed an executive where the President of the United States, uh, Roosevelt, Frank, called 9066, the Japanese American Evacuation? How, how was that decision? How did that come about? And if you're at all interested as a young person or somebody who's a descendant of a veteran, it's really an interesting American story. And the best book is Americans, the best book on is Americans Betrayed by Martin Broadens. He was a professor at Berkeley and he wrote a history of the determination and the decision to intern Japanese Americans. I recommend that book highly, and you can get it on eBay. And he read newspaper clippings and studies and reports. The pressure and the decision to intern Japanese Americans was promulgated principally by California agricultural interests. People who owned farms, land, who actually wrote in their journals and in their newsletters, if we can prove that Japanese Americans are disloyal and they're removed from their farms for disloyalty, we can buy their land at, the, at a, a pennies on the dollar. So basically, Japanese Americans to a large degree were agriculturalists living in the Central Valley in California. And they owned, believe it or not, more than 10% of the agricultural land on the West Coast. So here was a tiny minority of two tenths of 1% owning 10% of the land, growing strategic fruits and vegetables for the war effort. And they were displaced from their land, displaced from their farms and communities, and put into 10 prison camps, largely on the influence of an economic interest, a racist interest, that went as high as the White House. Luckily, Hawaii was different. The Japanese Americans living in Hawaii were spared internment. Why, why was it different in Hawaii? First of all, they were one third of the island. But more importantly, citizens stood up in Hawaii and said this is wrong and actually went as, as, to the White House, to Eleanor Roosevelt, to Franklin Roosevelt, to the Secretary of War, to the Secretary of, of the Interior, and argued against interning Japanese Americans from, from Hawaii. And only about 2,000 plus of them, the more than 100,000 were from Hawaii. So it showed that goodwill and good neighbors and good policy could prevent a tragedy in Hawaii. And the opposite, racism, bad will, and greed on the West Coast could have the absolute opposite effect. So that, it's a fascinating book on the politics of decision making. And it's, it's, it's a background how this little microcosm, this little tiny minority of Japanese Americans played a bigger part in the American civil rights struggle. So Japanese Americans had come to this country as early as 1885. In 1885, uh, why did Japanese come to, to Hawaii and California? What was the, the purpose of that? To work in agriculture, to work in the farms, to work in the fields harvesting sugar cane in Hawaii and pineapples. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting, ironic story, speaking of Ume. The king of Hawaii, King David Kalakaua, who 
going on a world uh, tour trip, and he st happened to stop in Tokyo, Edo, and he got an appointment with the Emperor of Japan. Uh, very unusual without really having an appointment, and he suggested to the Emperor and the leaders of Japan, wouldn't it be nice to have contract laborers from Japan allowed to come to Hawaii to help in the agricultural process? So the Emperor of Japan agreed, and if you go to the why state archives in Honolulu, you speak to the curator, they'll bring you out this big treasure box. And this big koa box has is the actual treaty that was signed by King David Kalakaua and the Emperor Meiji of Japan have a treaty to allow Japanese to come to Hawaii for the very first time to have legal mass immigration. It's a wonderful, beautiful document. Talk about an irony. There it is. So Japanese became part of the, the American dream starting in 1885. And how many years later? So 1885 to now is almost, what, 100 and almost 40 years of Japanese in the United States. But Japanese Americans are only two tenths of 1% at this point. So they're fighting in wolf. They're, they're, they're invited to fight in the European theater by General Mark Clark. And Mark Clark gives them these really tough assignments. And almost from the very start, Japanese Americans were proving themselves. They were sent as spearhead units to fight in major campaigns and lead fighting with Texas soldiers and soldiers from Oklahoma, from the 34th Division. So they fought in an entire Italian campaign winning battle honor after battle honor. They fought um, in Italy, battle for Monte Cassino, and were liberating towns and villages all over Italy. Then they were sent to, to France, the 7th Army, to fight for the, for the invasion, towards the invasion of France, of the Vosges Mountains, for the invasion of mainland Germany. So they fought with the 7th Army and the Texas 36th Division fought in two major campaigns, one to, to liberate a series of towns, De Fontaine and Bruguer, also to rescue 200 Texas soldiers that were caught behind German enemy lines. So that was some of their toughest fighting, and they fought for several weeks straight. And they rescued 200 soldiers, and they had eventually won, depending on how you count it, seven presidential unit citations, more than any other unit at the time. They then fought in, by the way, the battle for the rescue of the Lost Battalion, which made newsreels, was so spectacular that it made national news. And in the 1960s, the US Army said, what are the top 10 battles in the history of the United States Army? And they declared the rescue of the Lost Battalion be among the top 10 battles in the entire 200, 250 year history of the United States. So there's a little tiny unit making all this history, and people are watching that. The press is watching it, the newsreels are watching it, the Department, the Department of the Interior, and the, the Department of Justice, the FBI, and there's movements by citizens groups putting pressure on the, the Army, the War Department, and President Roosevelt to close the camps. And they're saying, how is it that you can have this unit doing so well, and how is it that you can justify having these camps, declaring these people to be, to be, to be enemy aliens? They were declared 4C enemy aliens. I had the honor in living in San Francisco of interviewing and talking to a number of those citizens who fought against the injustice of interning Japanese Americans. And there's a number of them. One of the most uh, tender was uh, that of Elaine Haas. Elaine Haas was the granddaughter of Levi Strauss, and head of the Columbia Foundation. She had went to Berkeley, California with a lot of Japanese American friends. And when she heard that Japanese Americans were interned, she went to the federal government, raised several million dollars, and had a program to allow 
Nisei's uh, to leave the concentration camps to go study on the East Coast. So the Columbia Foundation and other, uh, other notable Americans fought against having these camps remain open. So because of political pressure, because of the um, patriotism and the war record, the government literally began to uh, administer a system to shut the camps down, let people leave, go to college, or work in agriculture. Uh, Amy Fisk, my partner, her uh, family owned a bean farm in uh, Missoula, Montana, and a number of Japanese Americans uh, worked as harvesters for the bean farms, including Mo Nakasaka, who was with L Company. So Japanese Americans were let out of the camps. The other thing that was kind of interesting from it, the position of the Japanese government, the United States knew that the war was winding down and eventually the United States would have to be part of the occupation of Japan. So realizing that it was a black mark on Americans having uh, an internment camp for a minority, the government says we need to close these camps down because of the international uh, bad will that it's created. And how can we occupy Japan and discuss democracy when we're maintaining camps and segregating Americans in the desert? So part of this international strategy of, of the war was about ending, ending the, the, the wrongful decision to intern Japanese Americans. And Mike Masaoka, I had interviewed him, and Mike confided in me that a number of very high officials, in, including um, John J. McCoy, apologized to him for the wrong-headed decision to intern. He said, we were given this information, and had I known what I know now, we never would have interned Japanese Americans. And he apologized to, to Mike, and he said to Mike, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of for all my accomplishments as Under Secretary of War <coughs> was my advocacy for the creation of the 442. And he told Mike that, you know, if, if it was up to him, he would put that on his tombstone. So he's very, very proud. The two officers who actually came up with the decision to intern Japanese Americans were actually, um, they were not formally reprimanded, but informally their careers were cut short because of the deception that they did of saying that Japanese Americans were disloyal. One of them was General DeWitt, who was given a not such a good assignment and Colonel Carl Vendetz and his adjutant were both not demoted, but sent off to inconsequential assignments and disappeared in the history. Neither one of them apologized. They were, I actually had a chance to interview Carl Vendetz, the, the, the action officer, and he was never apologetic to me. He never said what he did was wrong, given all that. I was very surprised by that. So you have the Japanese Americans then fought in Italy in the last campaign, and they fought in eight major campaigns. They came home, and President Roosevelt, uh, President uh, Truman, the new president, uh, invited the Japanese Americans, leaving the troop ship, to come to the White House and be honored as, as a battalion. And he had a special parade. July of 1946 was on the newsreels of it. And President Roosevelt came out on a rainy day and he pinned the seventh and eighth presidential unit citations on the flag, the gopher boat flag. And this is what he said, and it's reported in history. You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudiced, and you won. Keep up that fight and make the Constitution stand for the welfare of all of the people all of the time. So there were uh, about 4,500 members of, of the 442nd, but the unit suffered 314% combat casualties in the eight campaigns. You say to yourself, how is it possible that any unit can have more than 100% casualties? Well, there were so many people being wounded, they were eventually called the Purple Heart Unit, that the unit was turned over more than three times. So according to Mike Masaoka, the unit suffered 314% combat casualties. 
So not only were they the most decorated unit of all time, which is something you, you couldn't make up, and by the way, there were 2,700 regiments that fought in the United States Army in 250 years. And this is the most decorated unit of the whole time. How about MIS? Now the MIS story. Oh, I just was about to do that. So if the 442nd had a, had a tactical advantage for the Army, the 5th and 7th Army, to win its campaigns, was a small effect on the overall strategy of the war. But there were 6,000 Japanese Americans that served in the Pacific campaign as military intelligence officers. It's called the Military Intelligence and Language Service. So before Pearl Harbor in 1940, the Army was anticipating a war in Japan and started recruiting Japanese Americans living in California and Hawaii who were native speakers of Japanese to serve uh, to do language translation, interpretation, and broadcast interception for the US government in anticipation of a Pacific War. So on November 1st, 1941, um, 60 people were recruited into the Army in the Presidio of San Francisco into the language school of the United States Army eventually trained 6,000 Japanese Americans that served in every theater of the Pacific War. They were translators, interpreters, they were intelligence officers, they were linguists, they interrogated prisoners. The net effect of these 6,000 soldiers had a strategic effect on the outcome of the war in the Pacific and World War II. According to MacArthur and his chief of intelligence, General Charles Willoughby, the effect of having Japanese native speakers in the U.S. Army gave the Army the strategic advantage over, over the, the war. And as a consequence, and this is in the official government report, the war in the Pacific was shortened. Now, this is absolutely humane. This is absolutely incredible shortened the war by two years and maybe saved a million lives. One million lives. Imagine a small group, only 6,000 people, having an effect on the Pacific War in such a profound way as to shorten the war and save a million people. Could you make that up in a million years? And in the words of Winston Churchill, never have so many owed so much to so few. And at the, it wasn't until 50 years after the fact that that secret branch of the United States Army was, was finally revealed in, in, in wartime service. It wasn't until the late 1970s and the early 80s that this was declassified. We finally began to understand specific and strategic role of Japanese Americans fighting against the land of their ancestry, but in an ironic way, saving people on both sides. Of all the things that I studied about Japanese Americans fighting in World War II, one of the most touching was the story of MIS, military intelligence soldiers, who got Japanese soldiers to surrender under terrible conditions. Japanese soldier was often told not to be captured by Americans. If they did, they would be tortured, they'd be starved, um, and under no circumstances they should take their life in lieu of being captured. So in many cases there was suicide, and so Japanese American soldiers would go into difficult situations, go into a, a, a unarmed, to Italian or a regiment of Japanese American soldiers, and for that, rather than surrender, they were threatening to hurt themselves, to kill themselves. And they would convince these Japanese Americans, these Japanese soldiers, to surrender in lieu of committing suicide. And what they said is, look, we're Japanese too. It, it, it won't serve any cause. We're not going to harm you. We're not going to torture you. They would often say, look, we'll give you some fish, we'll give you some rice, we'll give you medicine, and then if you want to harm yourself, you're, you're free to do that. 
So a number of, of Nisei soldiers saved literally thousands of people from committing suicide, and in particularly on Saipan and on, on Okinawa. So is there anything more precious in life than saving lives, than saving another human being, so that a human being could be alive, have children and grandchildren, and to live on? So the so the legacy of Japanese Americans after the war, they came home and said, you know what, um, we're going to change the face of America. We're not going to go back to the system that we went to before. Before the war, Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans and Filipinos were excluded from businesses, from land, from professions, from intermarriage. And the Japanese Americans, so the very soldiers who fought in the 442nd became senators, congressmen, state legislators, political leaders, and challenged all of those laws against Asian Americans. And Mike Masaoka, I asked Mike Masaoka, how many, how many laws were written in California and on the West Coast that were prejudicial to, to Asian Americans? And he said over 500. The JCL had documented 500 different laws enacted against Chinese Filipinos Japanese Americans, Native Hawaiians, and other minorities. And all of those laws were challenged by Senator Matsunaga and Senator Inouye and Norm Mineta and Bob Matsui and others and Mike Masuka and the JACL began to change the, the political face of America based on their patriotic war record. And by the nineteen the mid nineteen fifties, most of those laws had been retracted, including that there was a law against Japanese Americans being naturalized. So Japanese Americans were the last minority in America to be allowed to become citizens. As I said in my other speech, my grandparents who came to the United States in 1905 became citizens 10 years later. But if you came to, uh, to America from Japan, you couldn't become a citizen for 80 years until the mid 1950s. So in the mid-1950s, the law preventing Japanese Americans from, from owning land and, and voting and becoming citizens was finally repealed as a result of the work of Japanese American veterans of the 442nd. So this, this sounds like David versus Goliath, doesn't it? This, this is a story that almost has biblical proportions. How is it that a military an infantry unit and intelligence officers, but the smallest and the tiniest minority in America could have an effect on the geopolitical consequences of the civil rights movement in America. So their civil rights movement began in the 1940s, fully 25 years before the modern African American civil rights movement. And the African American civil rights movement was largely affected by the Japanese American civil rights movement. Mike Masaoka and the Japanese American leaders worked with Martin Luther King and worked with the other African American leaders and supported the civil rights marching of the 1960s. So, does it have a happy ending? I think it has the happiest ending you could ever imagine. In 1988, the United States government voted overwhelmingly through Congress, Civil Rights Act of 1988, an act that was numbered House Resolution what? 442, and named after the 446th Regiment, a, a, a national apology for the wholesale internment of 120,000 Americans without due process of law. And for the first time in American history, the United States government apologized for violating the civil rights of its own country, apologized in principle and in fact and paid reparations to a minority and vowed it had learned its lesson. First time, and the only time that reparations has been paid in the history of the United States was H.R. 442. And the year after H.R. 442, the African American community um, developed H.R. 40, which is, which is the study of slavery, the effects of slavery on African purposes of paying reparations. Forty years later, that reparations has yet to yet happen. For most Japanese Americans, uh, as we were developing this exhibit in the early 
since the JACL was developing its strategy to create um, a program to highlight Japanese American patriotism. So our exhibit, our Go for Broke exhibit, was used by members of Congress to support the notion of reparations. Another ume, ready for another ume story? But I couldn't, how much time do I have left? Uh, three or four hours left? <laughs> so, the president of my board of directors, how much time, Gerald, do we have left? How you guys, am I boring you to death? No. Oh, okay. yes. <coughs> I thought we, uh, the program was listening to you until three. Until three? When, until three? I thought that. What time is it now? It's love. It's love. Oh, so I have a whole more hour with you? Oh my god, that's <laughs> wonderful. Anybody have to use themselves? Go ahead. I'm going to tell you another Ume story, which, you know, as I tell you these stories, uh, I don't even believe them. You know, it's like sometimes it's like it's surreal, you know. Um, this is one of the most surreal. I'm going to tell you two more surreal stories. So, how is it the exhibit that you see out there? came to the Smithsonian Institution. That exhibit you see out there was created and adopted by the Smithsonian Institution in 1987. It opened up on September 17, 1987 at the National Museum of American History. The day that we opened up the exhibit, and the name of the exhibit on Japanese Americans was called A More Perfect Union, Japanese Americans and the Constitution. And the exhibit, why would the exhibit open on September 17th, 1987? How many people know their American history? What happened on uh, September 17th, 1987? Most people don't know. Is that when the Constitution was signed? That's when the Constitution was signed, and that's when the Japanese Americans uh, opened up the exhibit, More Perfect Union, and it was to celebrate the bicentennial, the signing of the Constitution. And the idea of doing the exhibit was um, as a direct result of a man who was head of the Smithsonian named Dylan Ripley. S. Dylan Ripley, he was the secretary of the Smithsonian. And the president of my board of directors of the museum was a retired lieutenant general named <coughs> Ray R. Pierce. He was a three-star lieutenant general he was commander of I Corps in Vietnam. He was the president of the My Lai Massacre Court of Inquiry. But during World War II, he was the founding colonel of Detachment OSS 101, which was a special prototype Green Beret style unit comprised of an entire battalion of Nisei soldiers. The, the unit worked hundreds of miles behind Japanese line, was considered one of the most effective the prototype of the modern Green Beret. OSS 101, um, by the way, recently won a, a Congressional Gold Medal itself. He was the commander of the unit. And Colonel Pierce had a captain, and the captain who commanded the Nisei soldiers of that company was none other Umay than S. Dylan Ripley. S. Dylan Ripley said, the best soldiers and the best experience I had in my life was serving with Japanese Americans in Burma, and we were so effective because of that. And he says, because of that, Eric and Ray, I am going to do an exhibit at the Smithsonian, and they spent $3 million building that exhibit, and that exhibit opened at the same moment that the debate over H.R. 442 was happening. What are the chances that the right people in right place at the right time is, is happening. I'm going to tell you one more Ume story. This will get, how many people got chills from this? Any, any chills? Not quite everybody. Raise your hand. Everybody has to <laughs> is there a book out on that unit? Uh, yes, there's two books. The best one is called The Deadliest Colonel, which is, which is and there's um, Behind Enemy Lines. There's two books. The Deadliest Colonel, Behind enemy. Actually, there's a third book, which I don't know the title. So there's three books. It's called Attachment 101. And actually, they made a movie, a Frank Sinatra movie, um, about, about Detachment 101. What are the chances? All these things. Um, 
So when, when the bill was passed by Congress, it had a 96% favorability. Did anybody know that? When HR 442 came up, it had a 96, a virtually no opposition. What are the chances of that happening? That a bill that's controversial, that's going to pay billions of dollars in information, and there's virtually no opposition. Could you imagine that happening today? <laughs> Well, so Congress passes the bill, and you had uh, you had two two obstacles. You had to, to have the uh, the finances, the entitlement, and the second thing you had to have a presidential signature. So Ronald Reagan, remember you had asked me how did this Ronald Reagan story happen? Did you get my email by the way? On so how is it that Ronald Reagan, a conservative president who wasn't necessarily known for his civil rights activism, how was it that Ronald Reagan was going to sign a bill? It was going to cost the federal government two billion dollars and, re and pay reparations to a minority for a footnote in American history. How is that going to happen? Ronald Reagan announced uh, before the for uh, long before he signed the bill that he wouldn't sign the bill and that uh, the administration was not going to support him. And all of the advisors said, "This is a dangerous precedent. Be paying reparations for violating uh, American civil rights." We're going to be liable for lots of other causes. So he was advised and agreed not to sign the executive order, not to sign the, the, the legislation for HR 442. So for those who haven't heard this story, I have another Ume story before we go. And the story is 1980, as I'm collecting artifacts for the exhibit. I'm working with Chester Tanaka, and Chester Tanaka was in K Company, and he brought in his friend uh, John Goto, and he brought in his wife June Goto, and June Goto's uh, maiden name was Masuda, M-A-S-U-D-A. And she said, I think I have an artifact that you might like for your exhibit and the story that will go with it. So this is almost a year before we opened the exhibit. I said, please sit down and show me what you have. So she had a Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second highest medal that the government has. She had a photograph of her mother and herself getting the medal from a distinguished general named Joseph Vinegar Joe Stilwell, and a news clipping from the Japanese American Citizen League saying how General Stilwell and his assistant came to Santa Ana to give a posthumous medal to her brother who was in the 442nd who had been killed in the last campaign in Italy. Here's the story. Kazuo Masuda, her brother, had been killed in the last campaign in Italy, firing a mortar to defend his, his buddies, and was killed in the process. And the family asked for the body to be sent home to be buried in California. They were from Santa Ana truck farmers. They wanted to bury Kazuo Masuda, their son, and her brother in the local cemetery. <coughs> a soldier who had won Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest medal, and the owners of the cemetery and the town council said, this is a whites only cemetery. No colored people, Japanese Americans are considered colored. You can't bury your hero son in our cemetery. And it made national news. General Stilwell, who was the commander of the Presidio at the time, the Sixth Army commander, who was commander of the China Burma India Theater, who fought with Mises, said, This is horrific, this is this is intolerable. So he said to his assistant, the, his aide de camp, who was the captain in the public affairs department, what was the name of the captain who was his public affairs assistant? So many people know. Him. His name was Ronald Reagan. <laughs> or is it pronounced Reagan? Ron, Ron Reagan was a captain, a uh, reserve cavalry officer serving at the Presidio as an assistant public affairs person. And he and Stillwood went to California to present the, the medal, the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest medal to the Masuda family. And Ronald Reagan wrote a beautiful speech, which was um, quoted in the Pacific Coast and it was quoted in the National News. To you now. Blood that runs into the sands of the beach is all one in color. 
America stands unique in the world as a country based not on race or color, but on the heart and the ideal. And we're all Americans. And he said to Mr. and Mrs. Masuda, we honor your son for what he did and his heroism as an American. And they presented the medal to Judith and to her mother and father. Eventually, they, the, the town apologized, but he was not buried in that cemetery. So 40 years later, uh, I received the medal and the clipping, the news photo. And ironically, Ronald Reagan in 19, had just been elected president of the United States. And I said, is there anything more ironic? And I wonder if this little story, this little beautiful medal in the story will have some implication as to our telling this story later on. So after we heard that Ronald Reagan was not going to sign the bill, we had Grant Ujifuso, who was a, a congressional writer, uh, give the medal and the clippings to Governor Keene, who was friends with Reagan. They met with Reagan and he said, look, look at this beautiful medal, look at this story. Do you remember giving the speech? And Ronald Reagan says, yes, I remember. And you know what, I think I'm gonna sign that bill. And he did sign the bill on the, the remembrance of his giving that medal. He turned on a dime. And on the day that the bill was signed, June Goto and her husband were in the audience along with other Nisei's of K Company. He said it was because of you know, your, your brother that I signed this bill. Ume. How could you make up a story like that? Was that meant to be? Was all of this meant to be? I'll ask you a question. You know, how many of you are, are optimists out there, believe the world is a good place? Raise your hand. Does my telling you these stories influence you even more to feel that is a good place. Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass, the great African-American civil rights leaders, both said that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. How many people believe that the moral arc of the universe does, in fact, bend towards justice? And how many people now believe that this was part of the bending of justice, the moral arc of the universe, and that we as, as human beings, for what we do, for what we say, and what we believe, can change the world, can change politics by our intentions and by our hearts and by what we believe. So I have nothing more proud in my life than to help facilitate a story and give birth to a story that was an American story Without, without parallel, the story of democracy and justice and honor and duty that worked and made America a better place and we're all better because of it. 20 plus years ago, after 9-11, I woke up one morning, I couldn't sleep, it was four o'clock in the morning and there was a news conference, President Bush was making announcements and this is right after 9-11. And he, standing behind him was Norman Netta. Norman Netta was the Secretary of, of Transportation, the Secretary of Transportation. And I said, I think I know what he's about to say. And George, would you make, does anybody remember this incident? George Bush came out and said, well, we are not going to hold Muslims accountable, Muslim Americans accountable for what happened you know, on 9-11. And I want to assure my fellow Muslim Americans that what we did to the Japanese, did to Japanese Americans, we are not going to do to you. This country learned its mistake, and my Secretary of, uh, of Transportation reminded me that this is not going to happen again. I absolutely bawled when I saw that. I said to Norm, you know, what a hero you are, what a hero if you, you would take this story and apply it to, to democracy. 
So I interviewed Spark Matsunaga, who was the junior senator from Hawaii, and I was going to talk to him and ask him about fate. Even though he was from Hawaii and he wasn't, or neither was the senator Inoue, they felt a kinship to the Niseis from the West Coast, and they worked tirelessly for the passage of H.R. 442. In fact, I think without their, their work, it probably wouldn't have been passed. And they were so popular. They were so well liked, and they called in all of their their favors and all of their kindness and their their sweetness, and convinced the members of the Senate and the members of Congress, along with Mormonetta, to sign and get 96% favorability. And I asked Spark, you know, was there? What did you feel about doing this? And he said, I knew. That, that I had survived the war as a member of the 100th Infantry for a reason. And I knew what that reason was when that bill came up. He said, I knew that I was born to help make that a realization, that civil rights bill. I survived the war so that I could make that happen, and it was the, the, the single most important thing of my life. Again, in a way, and you, you just, just could not make this stuff. Absolutely beyond the story, and, that, and if you had, you know, four more hours, I could tell you four more hours of stories uh, of the, the, the heroism of the soldiers and the commitment of their officers and political leaders. I made up a list of 700 individuals in California on the West Coast who basically opposed the government's policy of the tournament. These were newspaper editors political leaders, um, labor leaders, who actually did, went out on a limb to, to basically oppose the internment. And there were hundreds of people living in California who protected the property of Japanese Americans, who took over the land, uh, held their property, paid their taxes, harvested their, their property, took care of their furniture, their farm animals. And there were Danish farmers and Swedish farmers and German farmers. Mexican farmers, people all over California, all over the West Coast, that stood up for their neighbors. And their stories are too often not told, along with the Caucasian officers and the other political leaders. One of the, 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 the political leaders who made a mistake was the Attorney General of California in 1941. Who was the, who was the, the Attorney General of California in 19? Who remembers Earl Warren? Oh my God. Earl Warren became the Chief Justice of the American Supreme Court, was appointed as a conservative justice, but turned out to be one of the most liberal justices, supporting all the civil rights causes of the 1960s. Earl Warren was in complete support, in support of the internment of Japanese Americans. And after the war was over, he realized their war record he came to severely regret his decision of being an advocate. And when he was um, interviewed later, he said one of the reasons he became a liberal Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, was because of how much he had regretted and how much he wanted to make up for the terrible mistake he had made during World War II, deciding on, on the internment of Japanese Americans. So again, a tiny minority having a strategic and tactical effect on the American evolution of its civil rights movement, a military unit, um, it's epical. And I think, um, didn't Dave Ono capture that? Dave Ono is, is, the, um, is the head of KGO TV in Los Angeles. He's the chief anchor of the Japanese American third generation. And he just had a presentation at the Kennedy Center last Saturday. We talked about Japanese American patriotism and how it had its, its effect on American history. One last story I forgot to tell was one small battalion of the Japanese Americans, their artillery battalion, was attached to Germany at the end of the war and actually fought on German soil. And as a consequence, uh, they fought the last three months in the war and actually liberated some German sub camps of Dachau, some actual German Nazi concentration 
or eyewitnesses to the Holocaust. Some of those naysayers were actually attorneys from California. And the, and the idea that they were liberating concentration camps in Europe when their parents were interned in the United States was not lost on them. So we were able to, to document the story of Japanese Americans helping to save thousands of Jewish prisoners who were about to be murdered at the end of the war. And one of the books that the Heart Mountain Foundation just published was called Light One Candle, which is a survivor of account of one Jewish prisoner who was saved by Japanese Americans as liberators. Again, could you make any of this up? Absolutely you could. So I've told you that, if, you know who Ellie Wiesel is? Ellie Wiesel was a Nobel Jewish Peace uh, survivor of Auschwitz. Yeah, that helped, that helped uh, track down some of the uh, Nazis, did they also? That's, that's Simon Wiesenthal, though. Okay. That's right. Ellie Wiesel was a Nobel Peace Prize. He would use a, wrote uh, a trilogy autobiography of his experiences surviving the Auschwitz uh, death camp. He talks about fate, he talks about, he won the Nobel Prize as being one of the leading spokesmen of talking about, about the Holocaust. And, and in Jewish theology and many of the wisdom traditions, when you tell a story like I'm telling to you, I tell this to you to enlighten you, to make your, your life better and to understand life. So I ask you, as, as, as the children of the veterans and the friends of the veterans and of, as the Japanese people telling the story, to continue to tell this story and to use this as an example of the best of humanity so we can make this a better world. And I think you can. And I thank Gerald and all of you who work towards educating the American and the Japanese, the JICC and the Japanese embassy for Wonderful dedication, uh, Mr. Atsuchi, where is he? Atsuchi san, for his beautiful installation. And we can tell the story, and maybe someday we can again tell this story in Japan to the Japanese people. They continue to make the world a better place and make democracy stand for what it really means the welfare of all of the people, all of the time. So, thank you so much, and I appreciate your time and your courtesy. And your Attention, give yourself a round of applause. Come on, Aaron. Really, uh, really appreciate uh, Eric's lifetime work in, uh, in this area and bringing this exhibit, but also the dedication he has had uh, in terms of uh, exploring the history. And so, uh, on behalf of JAMA, as well as the JICC, uh, we uh, thank you for your uh, contribution. And uh, as a token of our appreciation, this is an image of the uh, Go for Broke stamp. Um, it took us a number of years to get it done, but uh, I hope you will uh, enjoy that. Very much so. Thank you. This is a conversion um, uh, gold medal cup. And for Amy, I have a cup uh, which is a um, uh, image of the uh, stamp. Um, every uh, uh, July 15th, for the last four years, we have a uh, ceremony. World War II Memorial um, on July 15th at 12 noon, which is the uh, uh, same time in 1946, Truman welcomed back World War II. And uh, we uh, hold the ceremony. Uh, we call it the Day of Affirmation because that's the time when uh, President Truman uh, affirmed that uh, the New States soldiers were loyal to U.S. citizens. So, Amy, this is for you. Uh, Eric, I also have uh, a Java pen for you. And uh, a uh, 
job of twenty. That's just your name and grade on the my honor to work with, with Gerald and the veterans these last 44 years. The greatest honor of my life. And as, as, as long as my legs will carry me, I will continue, will continue the fight to tell the story for the veterans, for their families, for America, for Japan, and the world. Let's give Eric a hug. Anybody? I have a microphone if you want to. Yeah. Hey Eric, uh, Rod is on the Java. Uh, it's ready to talk. Uh, one question I had was. Uh, was there any relationship between the military intelligence service and the Ritchie boys? My understanding is they were separate units. They had similar roles in different theaters. And a lot of the Ritchie boys were uh, uh, European Jews that had been able to flee the Nazis and had knowledge of your country, the government, the area, all of that, so we're excellent assets for the U.S. Army. Yeah, so has everybody heard of the Ritchie boys before? These were a German and Austrian Jewish uh, refugees that came over in the 1930s before World War II, and they were recruited into the military intelligence service as native German speakers, and they volunteered as intelligence officers, and there were hundreds of them. And they're called the Ritchie Boys because they were um, trained uh, at Camp Ritchie. And there actually was an MIS uh, detachment of, I think, 500 people trained at Camp Ritchie. And they're actually, uh, Camp Ritchie is a, uh, like a state park now, and they're actually making a museum out of the old post library in honor of the Ritchie boys and they've asked me to contribute photographs so there'll be a, a mini museum of the story of the Ritchie boys and how the Ritchie boys actually interacted with the same principle so these were Jewish um, refugees who came to the United States kicked out of their country you know, and basically served in the same strategic uh, service of interrogating German prisoners translating documents. Um, and they were amazing. There were far more G German speakers though than there were Japanese. So, but eventually there were hundreds of uh, Jewish translators working taken into the army and, and a lot of them fought. And of course, you can imagine <clears throat> the empowerment uh, fighting against a country who had basically dispelled you and killed millions. And they were proud. What a, I had the, the I worked at the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and there were a number of translators who were Ritchie boys. One of them uh, worked as a translator at the, the Nuremberg trials, and he was interrogating the high Nazi officials. And his job was interrogating Hermann Goering, who was the number two man in the German. So here was a Jewish guy, a high school student, interrogating the, the, the mastermind of, of the final solution of the murder. And uh, Goering said to him, uh, you must have a lot of satisfaction, must bring you a lot of satisfaction to have me sitting here in a jail cell and you interrogating me. He says, you can never know. <laughs> here. Um, can I just add to that in terms of the uh, Ritchie, uh, the Ritchie Museum? Um, the Ritchie Museum is about an hour and a half from D.C. in Maryland, and uh, a class of the MIS trained there, and then uh, part of the Japanese Americans were, uh, MIS was also stationed there. And one of the uh, Nisei soldiers uh, did a mural on the wall of the uh, one of the buildings, and that was uh, recently discovered. Uh, 
and it was still intact and it's being restored. Um, it's uh, the museum, I think, applied for a state grant. Uh, I think it was given $400,000 to restore uh, the building and the mu uh, mural. So if you go to Camp Ritchie, you, you can not only learn about uh, uh, the translators in French, German, Kellyanne, uh, but also uh, see the mural as well. Now, there is still a language school in ISIS at Presidio of Monterey, which has turned out you know, thousands and thousands of translators working in, in language. So the, the foundation of the American language school was Japanese language school, the Presidio of San Francisco. And it was founded, as I said, on November 1st, 1941, in an old Chrissy Field Army airplane hangar. And thanks to Nancy Pelosi, converted the, the hangar into an interpretive center. We got several million dollars, and it's a beautiful museum dedicated to the, the foundation of the uh, MIS school for the Nisei soldiers. And I, I knew uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Kihara, who was a language instructor. I knew John Iso, who was head of the school. And we've done oral histories with many of these, and the oral histories have been translated in, into biographies. So the work continues. So there's a book on John Iso, and um, there's two fine books on the MIS. And in about two weeks, we're coming out with a new book, which I recommend to you, called Angels of War by Mark Katabaz of uh, Oakland, California. Mark uh, interviewed Nisei soldiers uh, of the 522nd Field Artillery and got their experiences. And he also interviewed soldiers of the 761st Tank Battalion, which was one of the most decorated African-American tank battalions, or African-Americans, in World War II. And they liberated Mauthausen and parts of Gunkirch and concentration camps. And what this book does is compare the experiences of the Japanese-American and the African-American soldiers who, who suffered discrimination in their country and their observation of seeing the concentration camps seeing the brutality. So this is a profound book, and it'll be out in about two weeks. And uh, the Hark Mountain Foundation is, is funding the book. And I hope to uh, next year publish Chetanaka's book, Katonk, which if anybody says, well, I have the, I have the manuscript. And this is a, a fabulous story, Nisei soldier story. Now, Chetanaka has a very interesting, so another Ume story, Chetanaka, grew up in, as I mentioned, in St. Louis, and he was, he worked directly with Mike Masahoka as his assistant PR officer for the 442nd, and he wrote the original Blue Book, uh, First Japanese American History, it's a 442, and he wrote it in Italy during the war, and he volunteered to work with Mike, third battalion, and what his job was, was to write the medal citations after each battle for the battalion. He was working with Colonel Purcell, and he actually wrote out most of the citations for the 3rd Battalion. So the citations were not written by the Caucasian Hakujin officers, but by the soldiers under Mike's authority. So they wanted to make sure that the narrative was accurate, and they wanted to make sure that the most articulate and educated message we're documenting all these stories. So one of the reasons that we have so much information was the Niseis took it upon themselves to document and to make sure who deserved the medal got it. So they were very careful. So this is the story uh, of how that happened and their relationship with, with the Caucasian officers. There's a lot of a lot of side stories that are really not material, but one of them was the Niseis themselves took it upon themselves to write the the citations and and for Mike Masahoka was to make sure that these press releases and the wartime history got into the mainstream you know media and after the war Mike helped organize a group of Caucasian officers to go around California to give talks to various California communities where Japanese Americans would be returning and saying these people are coming back 
and these, these men serve with me as soldiers honorably, so there shouldn't be any prejudice about them coming back. So there's all these side stories, you know, that might possibly. So there was a, there was a, a, a tremendous level of sophistication by these young Nisei's in their 20s, you know, um, to really help write their own history, promote the history, and use it for good, that would still resonates 80 years later. We're here 80 years later as a consequence of their courage and foresight. And Okama Samade, that sort of, if my pronouncing that right, Okama Samade, means I am because of you. I, I am because of what you've done, and you've laid the groundwork. So in Japanese culture, everybody, mochitsu, motaritsu, we all must help each other. So we are here today because of the legacy of the Nisei soldiers, who I believe are here with us in spirit. I know Chad and Rudy and Tom and Harry and all, all the, the hundreds of people that we work for, that we're so proud to, like, to give this presentation to their, to their children. So to the children of the veterans, the legacy of the grandchildren, it was for you. Oya koko, kodomo no tamine, for the sake for the sake of the children and for the love of the family that they did this. We still live with that. Can you speak about the role of the MIS in uh, post-war Japan? Oh, absolutely. Uh, 6,000 uh, 6, Japanese Americans served in the Army of Occupation from 1945 until 1952. So the American Army occupied Japan and they administered. How do people know what the Marshall Plan is? Marshall Plan. Most people don't remember what the Marshall Plan is. And for those who don't know, uh, under, uh, Marshall, who then became the Secretary of State after he was the commanding general said the way to keep the peace of Pacific and was to not to have retribution against Japan and not retribution against Germany, but to rebuild and have reconciliation. So it was one of the most benevolent peacetime post-war occupations of Germany and Japan. And basically billions and billions of dollars went into the economies of the two countries to make them allies of democracy, to democratize the country. And that was all administered largely because of the Japanese linguist skills of, of the Nisei's. So in, in writing a new constitution of Japan, and passing civil rights law, and liberalizing the country, and developing commerce and trade, and it literally the role of Japanese Americans, these, these Hibei and Nisei's, was to, was to build a bridge between the two cultures and their parents' cultures. And I'll tell you one last story that was told by Khan Tagami, which which has been published, but almost nobody's heard. Khan Tagami was a Kibe Nisei who was studying law in Japan as a teenager just before the war, and he came back just, just, just before Pearl Harbor, and he served as, a, as an MIS interpreter, and he was actually promoted as captain. Because of his lingu linguist skills, he was General MacArthur's personal interpreter during the occupation of Japan. Have you heard the story of Khan Tagami? So Khan Tagami, whenever he, he would appear before uh, the emperor of Japan, Khan Tagami would translate as the Kibe Nisei. And Khan told me in the oral history that when he was a teenager going to high school in Japan, every day uh, at the beginning of class, you had to stand up and swear allegiance to the emperor of Japan. It was a picture of the emperor, and you would bow down, and you would say, you know, uh, you would do an honorific the emperor, and he would tell the teacher, you know, I'm an American, you know, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm Japanese, but I'm really an American, and I, you know, the emperor is not my emperor, and the teacher would always hit him and said, no matter what, you're still Japanese, so I want you to bow down. You're going to bow down, it depends whether you like it or not. He says, said, the emperor is the mountain, Yamato, he's the land, he's the everything, he is the leader of our country, and you're only an inconsequential little feather, you're a little nothing. Who are you not, not to pay obeisance to the emperor? So MacArthur uh, would bring him, she said, I was a little feather going to meet the mountain. I was now thinking to myself, I had to bow down before the image of this man. Now I'm speaking to him. 
man to man, eye to eye. One time he told me he, MacArthur sent him on a special interpretive mission to explain a, a particular occupation policy to the emperor of China, all by himself. It was completely out of uh, court ritual to have a one-on-one -on -one between a, a commoner and the emperor of Japan. And Kantagami explained to the emperor a particular civil rights issue. And the emperor said, thank you for explaining to me. I understand. Arimasu. Um, tell me a little about yourself, Tagami. I said, oh my god, the emperor of Japan is asking me. I'm just a feather. <laughs> and he said, well, we're from California. Uh, I studied in Japan. And the emperor sighed and said, Oh, there must have been so much aggravation that would cause the group because of the war. And the emperor said to him, I'm sorry that there was a war between our peoples and it affected your family so much. And he couldn't believe his ears. The emperor, the emperor does not apologize to anybody for any reason. But on this, this private conversation, he said, Tagami, Tagami san, thank you for what you've done for our country to, 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 to bridge the gap between. And I'm sorry for the, for the trouble between our two peoples. Can you imagine that story? And it's published on two, uh, Khan published an autobiography. And I call the story The Mountain and the Feather. By the way, Wu Mei. You know the story about <clears throat> MIS guys who met his high school buddy? Do you know that story? No. Met his interrogated in person turned to be his high school buddy in Japan. Yes, yes, uh, Mr. Higa. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, it, it was on um, Okinawa. It's it's a the presentation. It's it's a little thing. So so a lot of Japanese Americans MISers when they would uh, capture prisoners. In some cases, they knew them. And in one case, he had gone to high school with these particular these particular soldiers. And what Japanese Americans would do for the prisoners would get them food, and medicine, and supplies and give them confidence to say, look, we're not going to harm you. Um, what, one of the sweetest cases was Nobi Yoshimura of um, San Francisco, California, captured a bunch of Japanese soldiers and was interrogating them on New Guinea. And they all had typhoid fever, and they had dysentery, and they were sick as dogs, and they hadn't eaten. So he arranged for them to have cooked rice and fish and medicine and quinine for malaria. And he basically, a battalion of soldiers behind barbed wire, he and his fellow Nisics nursed them back to health. And one of them was, to, was Mr. Tagami, who was the owner of the N, uh, NHK franchise in Nagoya. And they became lifelong friends, and they stayed, they stayed together. And um, he invited Novi and myself and a group of Japanese Americans to tell our story in Nagoya. And this exhibit there, we showed in Nagoya in the 1990s. Mr. Ikami said, if it wasn't for the kindness of um, Nobi, I, I, I would have survived the war. So this was really a humanitarian story. That, you know, what was the reaction in, about the public in, in Nagoya? The what? what was the reaction by the Japanese public? Largely, the story of Japanese Americans is not told in Japan, so it was it was all new new teaching to them, and they were surprised the story had such resonance. So but almost everybody who saw it was, I had to heard this. And, and hopefully one of these days we can, we can again uh, bring this, this story to Japan as a way to, to bridge the two great cultures of the world. Japan, is, it, it really is a bridge, a bridge to the sun, a bridge to, to the east. So most, most of them did not, and were, were very interested. We did this exhibit, by the way, at of all places in 1984 at Pearl Harbor. Ran for a year. We did the Go for Broke exhibit at Pearl High Ground Zero for <laughs> World War II history. <clears throat> and I, I, as I was putting up the exhibit, I noticed most of the tourists that were visiting at that time Pearl Harbor were Japanese tourists. And they hadn't heard of Pearl Harbor and wasn't really taught in school. <clears throat> and they were seeing the story for the first time. It was, it was kind of, I was kind of interested to hear their perspective on it. And of course, he doesn't know the Japanese American story at all, really. Would you say that's true, that it's generally not known, <coughs> the story of Japanese Americans in Japan? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Archie Lee. My name's Dr. Mark Anderson with the Institute for Academic Management. Can you hear me okay? A little bit louder. Okay. So my name is Dr. Myrtle Alexander, Institute for Academic Management. I'm here in DC and when you opened up, you talked about fate and um, also um, being optimistic. Well, I registered for this event and it was canceled, I suspect, and then it was, I got the invitation again and I thought, oh, I can go because I had a duplicate um, event that night when it should have been before. And so I came today, and as I was coming, I guess a couple of doors down, there's the military um, where you enlist or where you the recruit, the recruiting office. So when you said fate, I was like, yeah, already that already happened today. Fate, I'm here with this, and I walked in. And the reason I say that is because I'm here in DC. I'm not from DC. I'm not even from America. I'm British, but I've lived here for some time. And I'm to launch an academy, a military academy here in DC. And I'm hearing these stories, and there's been so many nuggets from what you've said today that it's literally blowing my mind. I'm sitting here and I'm like, this can only be God, this is fate, this is serendipity, it's like, what else could it possibly be? My question to you is, and you just said it's not taught in many places, but is it even taught in American schools? This almost, story? almost not at all. Uh, it's when I, I grew up in the 1950s, 60s. <clears throat> it was not taught at all. It was not part of the curriculum. Slavery was not part of the curriculum. The cause of the Civil War was <clears throat> um, states' rights and economics. So they, growing growing up, uh, the view of America was very much skewed, and that's changed in the last you know 60 years. And now it's 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 part of the curriculum, but still generally not known by most of it, but if there's a documentary or a book on World War II, particularly on the home front, virtually every time there is, there's a, a lot of references to the Japanese American internment. So it's, it's taken on largely because of Japanese American historians and historians. Ken Burns in his World War II documentary did a big section on Japanese Americans. Uh, Life magazine did a history of World War II and National Geographic large sections were devoted to the internment of Japanese Americans and the implication of that. So the apology by the United States and by the examination of it is very unique in American history. When the Smithsonian decided to do the exhibit, the exhibit it was universally uh, not universally approved and there was a lot of criticism of it. And the idea was why would we celebrate the signing of the Constitution with a story about the failure of the Constitution and political leadership to protect the civil rights of its, of its citizens. And Dylan Ripley, the man behind it, said, what better way to teach the Constitution to show its failures and how we can protect it? So we can take examples of history, and there is zillions of examples in history, and teach them. And you can actually take the story that nobody knows and teach it and actually change the world by teaching this story. Um, and if, if any of you were interested, I could give you a whole bunch of stories that need promotion. And the stories of abolition, of slavery in the United States, the anti-war movement uh, against the war in, in, uh, in Vietnam, the, the re-examination. No country is perfect, no person is country, no institution is perfect, we're all subject to self-examination, and the Japanese American internment is an example of how a democracy should work, and we're hoping that eventually H.R. 40, the reparations for slavery, will reach critical mass on the same basis. The, the uh, Speaking of the reparations for African Americans, it has uh, an 80 plus percent unfavorability uh, in for most Americans and for most members of Congress. So many people believe that it has a low probability of passing. There's 50 million African Americans in this country, and that constitutes about um, 10 or 15 percent of the population. With that number, it is still largely considered an improbability, as opposed to two tenths of one percent of the Japanese Americans less than a million people able to get reparations 
what, why the disparity, why the difference, and can each group learn from the experiences of the others? And I think yes, if we're willing to learn. And it was magnanimous of America to apologize. And I know people don't like to apologize, countries don't like to apologize, institutions don't like to apologize. It's very hard, and when it does happen, it's an exception, but there's, there's six or seven major examples in world history that we can learn from. Germany, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, United States for the, for the internment. Stories of what do, what do we all want as human beings? We all want to be validated, we want to be affirmed, we want to be appreciated, and ultimately we want to be loved as human beings. And, and to, to be insulted or to be hurt is, is perhaps one of the most devastating things a person could have. And to have healing and reconciliation and love and an apology is the most healing thing that a human being can experience. So how can we change the paradigm for making it hard to apologize and to examine history? And how do we make it easy and understanding that it's healing and repairing for the whole world. I was raised in a, Jew, in a Jewish background, and the cardinal virtue in Jewish theology is a concept called tikkun olam, which comes from the Bible and the Talmud, the interpretation of the Bible. And it means um, to heal or repair the world. That every soul that comes into existence, the purpose of your existence, is to continue the healing and the repairing of the existence through love, through attachment, through, through reaching out, through apology, and that every soul is, is bound to make the world a better place through love. And every culture has some, every culture, every wisdom tradition in the world has some variation of that. Why do we find it so hard, you know, to apologize and to heal? Why are we, I was just talking with that sushi, you know, why is it so hard? For cultures to come together and, and, to, and to come together heart to heart, and soul to soul, knowing that we're all human beings floating on a, on a tiny biosphere, on a tiny blue marble in an infinite space. And we're all human beings together, doing nothing other than trying to love and get along with each other. Why is it so hard for us to do that? Why can't why can't love be a, a, a triumphal virtue of human beings, and, and, and not war, not violence, not hate, and not mistrust. So, so the moral maybe of all of these stories is, is can they be used as, as a moral healing and a bomb, as an engine for, for social change and improvement, and making us you know, the angels that we should be. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. One more question? Okay. Thank you. Eric, just a quick question. Uh, you know, lots been written about the 442nd. Uh, also, on Hukum and also, to some degree, the military intelligence service. Seen relatively little about two other World War II Nisei units. One is the uh, 522nd Field Artillery Battalion. And in fact, I, I think most people don't know that I believe they liberated Dachau. And then the other one, you almost hear nothing about is, uh, I think it's Charlie Company of the 1800 Engineer Battalion, which was all these sales. And I've never heard anything much about the Engineer Company. Yeah, and the role of uh, Nisei Wax, the women service. Um, there were hundreds that served in, in the military. It was also um, the um, Women's Auxiliary Corps and, and, the, and the Nurse Corps. So uh, the Japanese Americans served you know, in all these, these several things. They worked in agriculture, as I mentioned. They worked in the war industries, they gone to college. And um, all of these stories, well, particularly the story of um, the reparations. You know, almost nobody knows about reparations. You know, 
the story of Japanese American reparations. You know, Ed, uh, Amy and I are lobbying for HR 40. We actually are going tomorrow to the Hill to lobby for reparations for African Americans. Amy's great uncle, great three times great, was a, was a very, very, very famous abolitionist who fought against slavery and fought in the Union Army as one of the, the top eight generals in the Union Army. He was the deputy commander of the Battle of Gettysburg. He was the Sherman's uh, number two commander when the Sherman's March freed 50,000 people. And so we meet with African Americans you know, and say, do you know there's an HR 40 bill before Congress? Did you know? And they all say no. So how is it possible that 50 million people you know, who are citizens don't know that there is a, a bill of reconciliation out of there. Why is why are not why isn't that the heavens opening up? Why isn't there lightning bolts? Why is how is it that this is not a major thrust in, a, in the history of our could you imagine the healing for 50 million people when they got a letter of apology and when they got reparations and their pain, their 248 years of slavery, the pain was felt. For Japanese Americans, the most profound experience they had was receiving the letter from President Bush and Reagan, a letter of apology. It was nothing more, it wasn't the money necessarily, but it was the acknowledgement of the pain and the suffering, the acknowledgement of the mistake that was so healing. And for the veterans, the veterans were crying and they said to me, you know, our service and our sacrifice paid off and ultimately it was worth it. So how do we translate that story you know, into, into a greater American story and a greater world story? So the, the implications of, of healing in South Africa. Germany has had one of the most successful truth and reconciliation programs in the history of the world. And there's a book called Learning from Germany. And things that we can do as human beings and as Japanese Americans, as Jews, as, as every ethnic group in the world, aren't we here to heal the world and help each other? And the power of intention of whole groups working together, can we heal the world to make it a better place? We were just discussing with Matsuchi. How do we bring peace? How is that possible You know, to, to remove our tribalism and our, our fear how can we be more altruistic and more empathetic? I, of, I often say to people, Amy's a psychologist, and I talk to her psychologist colleagues, and one of the things that we ask, if you could raise your base level of empathy and altruism, would you? And I'll ask you, if you had the ability, by your own free will, to be more empathetic with other people, more loving, more kind, more giving, you do that? Would you raise your hand? Raise your hand if you would actually do that. We have a lot of altruists here. <laughs> Most people tell me they would find it difficult to do that because of fear, the fear that they would be taken advantage of or hurt as a result of doing that. One of the things we have to do is overcome our natural fear of each other, our tribalism, you know, and say, you know, we're all human beings born at the same moment, born on a, on a tiny look, eight billion of us, of, of, of souls floating in infinite space, you know, on this fragile, fragile little, little marble, this little green, blue marble. And aren't we all in this together? Can we raise our consciousness to see ourselves as inhabitants, you know, of the cosmos and not group A or group B? So you mentioned the word fear, and I was asked last week at an event, um, because we're here for, the, for education and to elevate education in this country for different segments of the population. One of the segments is children of veterans, children of alternative schools, children of, of American Indians, children of um, foster care, and privileged children. And they said, why is it that you feel that African Americans it's intentional that they are not educated to their fullest potential. And I said, nothing more than fear. Nothing more than fear. 
And so I didn't know about HR40, and it's been toying in my mind since I've been in DC. I've only been in DC four years, and totally crippled most of that, to run for Congress. And I'm sitting here, and as I'm sitting here, um, it's, I'm hearing HR40 is your platform to run for Congress, because so many people don't know. I had no clue. So I'm making notes, and I'm like, HR40, well, that's a platform. And when you mention apology, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands who made an apology for slavery back in December, and then King William, um, who made also the apology this summer. And for me, that was one of the most profound things I've ever realized in my lifetime. And I'm like, who's next? And so I'm just waiting for who's next. Could America be next? I don't know. But this, I mean, it's just an eye-opener for me to hear all that you're saying, because you just don't hear it, and especially not here in Washington, D.C. I mean, it took two tries for me to get here, and it's a struggle, you know? But I've got a purpose. And being here today is confirmation that I'm where I need to be. So thank you. So, so we'll, we'll uh, we have online. Amy and I have a website uh, uh, with a 300-page proposal for reparations. Reparations would be a collective to all African Americans to build wealth, education, health, to close the health disparity, the mental health disparity. It isn't necessarily a payment, but a, a building healing and, and, um, and, and a moral reckoning more than anything. The apology is the most important thing. The, the healing and the building. Most, most African Americans believe that it will never happen, very much like Japanese Americans believe it never happened. Jews after the war never believed Germany would apologize or anything. So our natural inclination is to be pessimistic. But we can be engines of social change. When you think of Martin Luther King or of any of the great leaders, Nelson Mandela, if you think of Gandhi, if you think of the great social workers. What prevents us from being a modern day Gandhi? You know, it's, it's only the power of our intention, the power of our creativity, and, and the optimism to know that you could actually do that. You personally could work, walk, work, walk on capital, on the capital, and just inform legislative assistance. You know, legis African American. <laughs> African American legislative assistants do not know there's a bill. They're working in Congress, they don't even know it. Workers in Congress don't know it. Um, it is, and how is that possible? It's almost, it's, it's anomaly beyond anomaly, but how can that be fixed? You know, how can we use a Japanese American success story to heal other people, to, to carry on? Mitch Maki's book, which we have on exhibit, as a blueprint for reparations, for a successful reparations movement. How could, how could you know, it, it seems so improbable that nobody knows about it, and that this is not at the forefront of President Biden, who needs to be reelected with an African American majority. How is it that nobody knows these stories? And I believe that every human being is an angel here on a mission. We're all human beings. We're all angels having human experiences. And there's nothing better than helping our fellow human beings to heal the world. Could you imagine being part, for me, being a, having a small part in the Japanese American healing and it justified my life a thousand times over. I'm so glad that I was born and I, you know, I sometimes feel, <clears throat> was I part of the destiny for, you know, for having a, why was I sitting in that chair I was like, why did I have that experience? Was I meant to do that? And I believe I was, actually. And I believe <clears throat> it was just simply the power of intention. And we all have that power of intention. Do you want to put your devotion to it? And when we, we go to the next world, you know, we'll be proud of what we've done. Will we, answer, will we have some, something really proud to answer for our existence? And maybe, I believe we're here for a reason. We're here to make the world a better. We're here to learn why we're here, and if we act on that, you know, I think we'll have a good accounting for ourselves when we go to the next side. And, and, I, and I hope that you all tell the story. And if you want to afterwards uh, talk to Amy and I about working on reparations, we'd be happy to talk to you. 
we were, we were working with, with a number of groups in Atlanta and with Ian Cobra. We were working with the Susie King Taylor Center in Savannah and a number of African American groups trying to empower them. And they don't know about the Japanese Americans, so we're, we're, we're training them. But there's so much pessimism, you know, and there's so much fear, you know, to wade it in, you know, into this. Uh, unlike the Japanese Americans, who were, uh, the leadership was largely fearless and optimistic. And I just can't tell you, you know, the, the, the political sophistication of the senators and the congressmen and, and the, the groups who worked on it, the lawyers and the, the, the intellectuals. But it really was a small group that was able to do that, which is sort of David and Goliath. It wasn't thousands of people doing it. It was just dozens able to do reparations. And it was largely under the radar at the time, strategically. So meet with us afterwards, and we'll tell you how to do it. And anybody else?